Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson Chapter 11 What I Heard in the Apple Barrel No, not I, said Silver. Flint was Catton. I was quartermaster along of my timber leg. The same broadside I lost my leg. Old Pew lost his daylight. And it was a master surgeon, him and amputated me, out of college and all. <clears throat> Latin by the bucket and what not. He was hanged like a dog, sun dried like the rest, at Corsal Castle. But that was Robert's men, and that was, and combed of changing names of the ship. Roll the fortune, and so on. Now, what a ship was christened, so let her stay. It says, it was with Cassandra that brought us all safe home. It was with the old walrus, Flint's old ship, that I'd seen amok, with the red blood in fit to sink with gold. Ah! said another voice, that of the youngest hand on board, and evidently full of admiration. He was the flower on flock, was Flint. David, and Davis was a man too, by all accounts. Silver, said Silver, I never sailed along of him, first with England, then with Flint, and that's my story. Now here, of my own account, is the matter of speaking. I laid nine hundred safe from England, and two hundred thousand, and two thousand after Flint. Ain't, ain't, that ain't bad for a man before the mast. All safe in bank. We ain't earning now. It's saving, does it? You may lay to that. Where's all England's men now? I don't know. Where's Flint? Why, most of them on board here. Glad to get the duff. Been begging for that. Some on old pew has lost his sight. And might have thought shame spends twelve hundred pounds in a year. Like a lord in parliament. Where is he now? Well, he's dead and under the hatches. But for two years before that, shiver my timbers. The man was starving. He begged, he stole, and he cut throats, and starved at that by the powers. Well, there ain't much use, after all, said a young seaman. Tain't much for use of fools, you may lay to it, that nor or nothing, cried Silver. But now, you look here, you're young and you are, but you're as smart as paint. Now, I see you when I set my eyes on you, and I'll talk to you like a man. You may imagine how I felt when I heard this abominable old rogue addressing another in the very same words as flattery as he used to myself. I think, if I'd been able, that I would have killed him through the barrel. Meantime, he ran on, little supposing he was overheard. Here it is about gentlemen of my fortune. They live rough, and they risk swinging, but they eat and drink like fighting cocks. When a cruise is done, why, it's hundreds of pounds. Instead of hundreds of farthings in their pockets, now the most goes for rum in good fling, and to sea again in their shirts. But that's not the course I lay. It puts it all away for some here, some there, and not too much anywheres. By reason of suspicion, I'm fifty, mark you, once back from this cruise. I set up gentlemen in earnest, time enough t too, says you. Ah, but... I've lived easy in the meantime, never denied myself, oh, nothing heart desire, and slept soft and ate dain dainties all my days. But when at sea, and how did I begin? Before the mast, like you. Well, said the other, but all the other money's gone now, ain't it? You ain't, you dare not show a face in Bristol after this. <clears throat> Why, where might you suppose it was? asked Silver. The Revisit Lee. At Bristol, in the banks and place, answered his companion. It were, said the cook, but it were one that we spied the anchor. But my old missus had has it all by now, and the spyglass is solid. It's old, lease in good world and rigging, and the old girls ought to meet me. If I would tell you where, for I trust you, but I'd make jealousy among the mates. Can I get you to trust your missus? said the other. Gentlemen of fortune, returned the cook. Usually trust little among themselves. And right they are. You may lay to it. But I have a way with me. I have. When a mate brings a slip on his cable as to know me, I mean it. 
I mean, it won't be in the same world as old John, when there was some of the old fear of Pew, and that there was some fear of Flint. But Flint, his own self, was feared of me. Feared he was, and proud. They were the roughest crew afloat. Flint was the devil himself that would have feared to go to sea with them. Well now, I tell you, I'm not a boasting man, and you've seen yourself how easy I keep company. But when I was quartermaster, lambs wasn't the word for Flint's old buccaneers. Ah, you may be sure of yourself in old John's ship. Well, I tell you now, replied the lad, I didn't have a quarter like the job till I had this with you. John, but there's a nut, there's my hand on it now. And a brave lad you were, and smart too, answered Silver, shaking his hand so heartily that all the bitterness shook. And a fine figurehead for the gentleman of fortune I'd never clapped my eyes on. By this time, I'd begun to understand the meaning of their terms. By a gentleman of fortune, they plainly meant neither more nor less than the common pirate. And the little scene that I had overheard was the last act in the corruption of one of the honest hands. Perhaps the last one left the board. But on this, I was soon to be relieved. For Silver, giving a little whistle, and the third man strolled up and sat down by, by the party. Dick Square, said Silver. Oh, I know Dick was Square. Returned the voice, Coxswain, Israel Hands. He's no fo fool, his Dick. And he turned his quid and spat. But look here, he went on. Here's what I want to know, Barbecue. How long are we going to going to stand off on like blessed bumboats? I've had a most enough to Captain Smollett. He's hazed me long enough. By thunder. <clears throat> I want to go into that cabin. I do. I want their pickles and wines. <clears throat> and that. Israel, said Silver. Your head ain't much account. Nor ever was. But you're able to hear, I reckon. Least ways your ear it is big enough. Now, here's what I say. You'll berth forward, and you'll lie hard, and you'll speak soft. And you'll keep sober till I give word, and you may lay to that, old son. Well, I don't say no, do I? growled the coxswain. What I say is, when? That's what I say. When? By the powers! cried Silver. Well, now, if you want to know, I'll tell you when. The last moment I can manage, and that's when. Here's a first-rate seaman, Captain Smollett, sails the blessed ship of for us. Here's the squire and the doctor with a map and such. I don't know where it is, do I? No more do you, says you. When then... I meant, mean this squire and doctor shall find the stuff. Now help us get aboard by the powers, and we'll see. If I was sure that all the sons of the double Dutchmen, I have Captain Schmollett navigate us halfway back again before I struck. Why, we're all seamen aboard here, I should think, said the lad Dick. We're all fossil hands, you mean, snap silver. We can all steer a course, but who's the one to set one? <clears throat> That's what you all gentlemen split on. First to last. I had my way. I had Captain Smollett work us back into the trades at least, when we had no blessed miscalculations, and a spoonful of water a day. But I know the sort you are. I'll finish with them at the island. But soon the blunt's on board, and a pity is it. You'll never happy till you're drunk. Split my side. I've a sick heart to sail with the likes of you. Easy all, Long John, cried Elzerl. Who's a crossing of you? Why, how many tall ships, think ye? Now, I've seen laid aboard. And how many brisk lads drawing in the sun at execution dock, cried Silver. And all for the same hurry. Hurry and hurry. You hear me? I've seen a thing or two at sea, I have. If you on you lay your course and pint to windward, you wouldn't have ride carriages, would you would? But not you. I know you. You'd have your mouth full of rum tomorrow and go hang. Everybody knowed you was the kind of a chaplain, John. Every others as you could hand and steer as well as you, said Israel. They're like a bit of fun, and they did. They wasn't so high and dry. No how, They'd, but they took their flings like jolly <clears throat> companions, every one. So, said Silver, well, and where are they now? Pew was that sort, and he died a bigger man. Flint was, and he died of that rum at Savannah. 
Ah, they were a sweet crew. They was. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> but where are they? But, said Dick, <clears throat> when do we lay them at work? Are we... What are we gonna do with them, anyhow? There's a man for me, cried the cook, a meddling. That's what I call business. Well, what do you think? Put him ashore like maroons? That would have been England. England's way. Or cut him down like that much of pork? That would have been flints or billy bones. Billy was a man for that, said Israel. Dead men don't bite, she said. Well, he's dead now himself. Himself. He knows that the long and short of it now. And if ever a rough hand comes to port of it, it was Billy. Right you are, said Silver, rough and ready. But a mark here, <clears throat> you. I'm an easy man, I'm quite a gentleman, says you. But this time is serious. Duty is duty, mates. I give my vote. Death. Well, man, when I'm in Parliament and riding in my coach, home, unlooked for, and the devil is our prayer, wait is what I say. But when the time comes, why, let her rip. John, cries the coxswain, you're a man. <clears throat> You'll say so, Israel. And when you see, says Silver, only one thing I claim. I claim Trelawi. I'll wring his calf head off his body like these hands, Dick, he added, breaking off. You just jump like a sweet lad and get me an apple to wet my pipe like. You may fancy the chair I was in. I should have leaped out and run for it if I'd found the strength, but my limbs and heart alike misgave me. I heard Dick begin to rise, and someone it seemingly stopped him, and the voice of hands exclaimed, Oh, stow that! Don't you get sucking of that bilge, John. <clears throat> Let's have a go of the rum. Dick, said Silver, I trust you. I've got a gauge of a keg, mind. There's a key that you fill in a pancake, <clears throat> pankin, and bring it up. Terrified as I was, I could not help but thinking to myself that this was how Mr. Arrow got the strong waters and destroyed him. Dick was gone but a little while. During his absence, Israel spoke straight on the cook's ear. But it was a word or two that I could catch, but yet I gathered some important news. For besides other scraps that intended the same purpose, this whole cause clause was audible. Now another man of them joined. Hence, there was still faithful men on board. When Dick returned, one after another of the trio took the panicking and drank. One, to luck, other, here's the old flint, and Silver himself saying in a kind of song, here's to ourselves, and holding it aloft, plenty of prize and plenty of duff. Just when a sort of brightness fell on here on the barrel, and looking up, I found the moon had arisen, and was silvering the mizzen top, and shining white on the luff of the foresail, and almost at the same time, the voice of the lookout said, Land ho!